Hello, my name is Gary. And my name is Simon. This is episode 20 of EV Musings, a podcast about electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. Today's podcast is our 20th and it marks the end of season one of EV Musings. As a special feature, our podcast today will be a round table talking about numerous topics with various EV owners. Before we get started, I want to talk about what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks. Now that we have 20 episodes of this podcast produced, we're going to call this season one. As with all the good shows on TV, we're going on a little hiatus. That's a posh term for a break. We'll be taking a few weeks off from producing new episodes as we put together season two of the show. In season two, we'll be finishing our series on EVs you can buy at the moment, and we'll be covering the Kona, the e-Nero, the e-tron and the Tesla range. We'll also be looking at the upcoming vehicles due to be released over the next year or so. That'll be the Honda e, the ID3, the new Mini and the MG. Of course, we'll be talking about the state of charge providers in the country who are providing rapid chargers and where they're putting them. Uh, we'll be following up on news about any new GridServe hub locations as they get announced, and we'll hopefully have one or two surprises as we go along. If you have any requests or suggestions for episode topics, drop us a line at MusingsEV on Twitter. Between the end of this season and the start of the next, we'll keep tweeting regularly and reminding you of some of our more popular episodes so you can listen again, or for the first time if you're a new listener. And our feature topic today, we're going to be doing a round table. We've got a number of EV influencers in the space and we're sitting them around a table, a metaphorical one, to ask them what they think about certain aspects of the EV world. In our round table today, we have Leanne Roberts and her husband Neil, founder members of the Sussex EV Group. Neil has also taken on the mantle of being a point man for all the local EV groups around the country. We also have John Brooks, also known as Beardy McBeardface on Twitter. He's the man behind the Kent EVs group and he has, within the previous 24 hours of this interview, taken delivery of his very own EV, a BMW i3 in sporty red. There's David Harvey, who's been a long time EV driver, having bought an early version model S 60 kilowatt hour model and had it upgraded to the 75 kilowatt hour model. Finally, Simon Rowe, my co-presenter, who's had his i3 for well over a year and has no home charging. Our discussion was wide ranging, but I started by asking a philosophical question. On the continuum of nobody knew about EVs, right up to EVs are a thing and widely accepted in society, where do you think we are? I think that the uh, public perception of electric vehicles is, is definitely growing. Neil Roberts. Particularly uh, amongst young people. Uh, if you go to an event, you very frequently see young people under the age of 16 pointing at Teslas and saying, oh, there's a Tesla, oh, there's a BMW i3, oh, there's a, there's a whatever. And so in a certain demographic, the perception is, is massively increasing. I think we're, we're seeing a bit of a breakthrough as well with, with older age groups. With, with these, these different clubs which are existing now, there are far more people who are openly talking to people they work with, talking to friends and family. These clubs are going to big public events as well, like um, Eastbourne Magnificent Motors. There was an event in Lewis recently. There was another one in Rotherham recently. And these weren't specifically... Well, the Rotherham one, Rotherham one wasn't specifically uh, an EV-only event, but there were lots of people at that event to see normal petrol or diesel cars who were really really interested in the electric cars which were on display so the perception i believe is is growing seconded to what neil has just said leanne roberts certainly i think mixing evs with you know traditional combustion cars we have found there are a lot more people inquiring into you know asking the questions regarding range and your typical questions you get from a nice car owner who doesn't know about EVs but in a way that they're not asking these questions in a negative sense they are genuinely curious and I think that's that's a positive sign I think we've still got a very long way to go I mean there are still so so many people out there that think an EV can't meet their needs and there's a lot more education to be done but it's getting that education out there that's uh, challenging and hopefully we'll be able to do that more in the forthcoming years. Simon Rowe. So, so for me, it's, it's still early days. Mm -hmm. it's still, we're still in what we call the honeymoon period in that 
even though these have been around for some time, um, the adoption has started in full flow now. Mm-hmm. And I would say only over, I don't know what anyone else thinks, but I, certainly over the last year, it's almost had a sudden spike of, we've got to do something, EV companies are starting to either be created from new, mm-hmm. and manufacturers that haven't done it before are you know, really starting to kind of, we have to go at EV yep. or electric, we've got no other option. I saw a graph on Twitter this week. John Brooks. Where somebody put up a adoption curve for tech. Mm-hmm. And it was done in percentages. And where the percentage of EVs are compared to other vehicle, other cars on the road, we're still in early adoption stage. Yeah. And it was early adoption, there was something else, and then it was widely accepted, and then it was just run every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so looking at percentages where we are at the moment, we are still early adopters, which actually I personally think is quite nice. Yeah. yeah. David Harvey. They talk about is it, is it the S curve or the bell shaped curve on that early adoption thing? I just feel that, that that those kind of graphs do make sense, but I just feel that with cars psychologically, there's a, a lot of inbuilt resistance, and people expect a car to have a fuel burning engine in it. And I think the technology and the infrastructure will be better already long before people's attitudes. I, I think we could be I don't know four or five years before the, the psychology of the human being changes, and that'll be the last slowest bit to change. You're right, definitely. That that last bit is quite interesting. That that psychology part, because you're right. The amount of people I've spoken to, where it's not necessarily been the car looks great and looks fantastic, but it's not right for me. But they don't really know why they don't think it's right for them. They've never sat in an EV, for instance. They you know they they've never driven one and things like that. But it's almost in their head that, like you said, if it's not a combustion engine, it's not a car. Yeah. And I think it's almost like the mobile phone analogy that we've said before. It's like, you know, it's, it's kind of the latest gadget. So cars now are not really cars. They're, they're gadgets with wheels. Mm. You know, you look at the new Tesla and things like that. It's pretty much how they go now. You don't, you're not thinking about how the engine is serviced and things like that. You're thinking about how nice it is to drive or does it get me from A to B and less worried about how mechanically it's going to fail on you perhaps and things Mm. like that so there is a psychological thing to it as well i think we're getting there slowly i mean simon will agree um destination charges for someone like him where he doesn't have home charging options are an absolute must but where we are you do not have destination charges in our area of sussex for example um we're still waiting to see the tesco charge points go in um we're still waiting to see sort of other charge points at petrol stations where we are as well we're a little bit barren still um but what has been quite obvious in the last few months is um, and a lot of people on social media are commenting about all the new charging points going in at supermarkets which I think will help a lot of people that can't charge at home necessarily but I still think there are a lot of people that could benefit from an EV who can charge at home that still aren't just due to uh, myths and legends. One thing that um, I think would definitely help with, with all of this is for rapid charge points on major trunk routes being much much more visible Um, particularly uh, particularly in Europe the the Ionity network you get large banks of of Ionity chargers which are all have glowing lights on the top of them that you can see from the main road if if I was if I wasn't in the EV world I wouldn't necessarily know where any chargers were and certainly if I was just driving around I wouldn't see them Um, there might be uh, an Instavolt behind a garage. I certainly wouldn't see that. Um, There may be a Polar at a hotel, which I've just driven past. Without going into the car park, there's no way I would see it. Absolutely. Um, So a big fight in public perception is definitely visibility. If people can see that there are charges all over the place then they will have the confidence to know that yes I can drive one of these and know that I can go to place X without planning ahead of time mm-hmm. and I can find a charger yeah. I, I think that's an interesting point and certainly like you know you're saying about the visibility aspect of, of of doing that the reason that we know about chargers generally is because we know that there's apps like ZapMap and PlugShare and things like that and we've 
been in that community for some time so you get used to planning a journey or looking at an app or you know seeing that sort of stuff and having almost a backup to the one that you were going to go to but if they become like you said like everywhere and in supermarkets and oh I've always drive past there and I, I know that that's a bank of Ionities or a bank of Polars or wherever it may be your your case in point earlier around something behind a garage I was up in um, I think it was I, I was up north or north somewhere and I was trying to find a charger and it was tucked behind um, an air compression thing at the back of a garage and I could have easily drove, driven past it now if I was a complete newbie EV driver I wouldn't have even think say it must be here it's on the app it's definitely here and know it is if it was an average person you go i can't find it i'm i'm that's it i'm you know i'm kind of not giving up but it becomes a stressful journey on that rather than a, an easy one yeah. and the more visibility is there that it becomes less stressful and less of a less of a thought about it <laughs> Therein, I can see lies the challenge for the uh, the charge point manufacturers themselves. They can't put their own branding everywhere when their charge point is part of another company. So, for example, um, Shell Recharge is part of the Shell petrol station. Um, the BP Charge Master, again, that's part of the BP petrol station. You wouldn't necessarily see it unless you go in there. Um, places like Polar, that they're all located at Holiday Inns, a lot of them. They can't have a great big Polar sign outside the Holiday Inn, so... And I think um, as things change and I think as um, petrol diesel garages close, we might see that charge point manufacturers can then advertise the locations, you know, with bright signs like BP, Shell, SO do and be more obvious for the general public. But that needs to happen in order for bigger EV uptake so people can say, oh, yes, I know there's one here, there's one there. Something drastically needs to change with the infrastructure at the moment, particularly with the motorway infrastructure. Um, the problem we have is that far too many journalists are trying out this newfangled electric car and running into problems when they're trying to charge. Um, and then that gets into the mainstream media and people think, oh, that's not going to be no good for me, I can't charge it anywhere. Mm -hmm. But we know, as those in the EV world, and there is EV drivers, that problem probably isn't as bad as it you know you can find uh, alternatives and it's being of the mindset that actually if that's not working I've got to know where the next nearest charger is but Joe Bloggs who's driving around in his little Peugeot or whatever at the moment isn't doesn't think like that hasn't got that mindset so we've either got to make that infrastructure bulletproof like petrol stations are or we've got to change people's mindset in the way that they drive but i think there's going to be a big change in the coming year or so the likes of grid serve some of the bigger companies that are now looking at the uk and going people are buying evs we need to put the infrastructure but not just one or two chargers substantial things and whilst i'm a big advocate of grid serve but the principle, what they're trying to do is, let's not just put a couple of uh, things in, let's replace the service stations with everything about a service station, but for EV drivers. And I think you need, like EVs are a disruptive technology, you need disruptive infrastructure that goes with it and the backing of government to, to do that as well. I've got a, a kind of personal unofficial test of how good the infrastructure needs to be because about a month ago, I went to help a Model 3 owner at uh, Grantham Supercharger with a 16 bays and I could see him struggling, went to help, basically the car was a week old, he wanted to do his first supercharge and he thought he could just rock up at the supercharger and somehow plug it in and or pay. He hadn't done any prior preparation, had no prior knowledge and basically the infrastructure to be really good you have to be able to just turn up anywhere with a phone and a card and be able to just make it make the charging happen without prior research or knowledge um yeah because you don't you don't need a petrol car do you that's you right. know you, you you know where to go to fill it up you fill it up mm. you go and pay and that's it it hadn't occurred to this guy with the model three that you had to somehow have a, a special app or an, an rfid card he just thought you'd just turn up and just buy buy stuff and i think that's quite a stumbling block as well to people who aren't particularly tech minded mm. is having to have an rfid card for this one you've got to have an app for this one 
which is what I quite like about Ingenie and some of the others, is you can just rock up, contactless payment with your debit or credit card, job done. Mm. And I think that all charges need to be like that. Yeah. Now, that sort of brings us on to the subject of what is the government's role in making sure that the uptake of EV improves. Now, if, this, if we're talking about the infrastructure, if we take it as a given that in order for this to happen effectively everywhere, the government is going to have to put money into infrastructure. And they're already doing that through the Office of Low Emission Vehicles. But where should they focus on? Should, do we need more destination type charges in public car parks or do we need more rapids and high power charges? I think there are some good adverts about at the moment um, in terms of the education side. Um, I think it's the go low one at the moment which is trying to sell people to not think of cars as electric cars but just to think of them as cars. Mm -hmm. I think that's very good because it's brand neutral etc. Mm -hmm. The VW advert is very very good um, although they haven't only got the e-golf available at the moment but I do think that destination charges are quite important um, particularly I live in a seaside town and although we have got charges we could do with some more so that people can turn up for a day at the seaside plug their car in um, so those sort of destination towns and cities I think need more charges um, so that you know the people can do this um, and car parks are important as well. David Harvey. I think the government's got an important job to do in terms of this what they call nudging so I'm a bit wary of the government deciding where electric chargers should be put in place but I think they just they need to use the tax system uh, VAT and so forth so that um, you know, pubs restaurants businesses have quite a, a good tax incentive to put destination charges in um, so I'd like the government to kind of step back a little bit and let private enterprise be sort of nudged in the right direction to do the right thing. John Brooks. Interesting contact from somebody, now I can't remember for the life of me which charger company it was, but they were working with Canterbury City Council and Canterbury City Council then came to us to ask our members um, where would you like to see chargers so that so the Canterbury City Council could get it right in putting in public charging. And I think more local council should possibly do that as you say get involved with the charging companies but then work alongside the ev current ev users to work out where charges are needed definitely i mean i i spoke uh, probably some time ago now to our local council because the same charging company that they use are pretty much across the council no matter where you are in the Hertfordshire area and I kind of said, well, why is that the only company that you kind of went with? You know, you've got Polar and you've got all the other companies. And they just said at the time that was just what was what was there. So I, I mentioned the likes of Polar and people like that. It's like, you know, what you've got in there is good, but it can be better. So like you were saying, John, the destination charging, I think, is more important than anything else. You should be able to go into a car park and there'll be rows and rows of destination seven kilowatt chargers. So a prime example is um, a place down near the Olympic um, Park in Stratford. They've got almost, uh, I think it's about something like 20 or 40 7 kilowatt bays. And you just turn up, there's never a problem to actually find a bay. Um, and that's how it should, should be. You know, it, like you said, seaside towns or, or towns where people are going to spend one to two hours or more, you should be able to park up and not worry about you having to move your car in those circumstances you know you're there for half a day a day you better plug in because there's more than enough there the rapid chargers have their place but not necessarily in inner cities and we're starting to see rapid chargers turn up kind of more in cities than on the outskirts and i think the the rapid chargers need to be there rather than um destination ones which are more um, I don't know, they, they, they kind of benefit everyone. So they benefit the EV drivers or they benefit the, the towns that you're going to because you, if you know that you're going to a town and you're an EV driver, you're likely to maybe plug in, spend some time going around and spend some money there as well. So it helps everyone, the business is there and you as a driver. Right, now, John, you have mobility issues and you use a uh, mobility scooter for some of the time. So what changes would you like to see to make your life with an EV easier? Um, it's been a bit of a struggle with Motability, which is the, the UK, or they are actually a charity, that are there to provide 
uh, preferential leasing agreements for people with uh, disabilities. Mm. For those people that don't know, you have to be on the higher rate of mobility, which sounds a bit odd because it basically means that you can't actually move very well to be eligible to have a mobility car. Mm-hmm. And I've had ongoing discussions with mobility about mobility about trying to get EVs because I knew my lease was coming up so a year and a half two years ago I started emailing them and contacting them and trying to get pure battery EVs onto the the stock list and it's only been in the last six months that that's actually happened Um, and I think that motability need to increase the number of EVs that are available and also with when you have a motability car there's normally an upfront cost and depending on the make and the model that can range anywhere from zero to seven eight thousand pounds and the upfront cost on EVs at the moment are in the thousands to give you an idea the two smart cars that they have available are about fifteen hundred pounds up front the Zoe is four thousand pounds up front but the BMW that I've just got is only £2,000 up front, um, which seems a bit odd because you'd think the Zoe's a much cheaper car, so yeah. it must be something to do with the deal. So they need to work something out with those costings because it took me a hell of a long time to put aside enough money to be able to put the upfront costs down. Um, we sort of went without quite a few things just so that we've got the available cash to be able to do it. So those sort of costs need to come down. Related to topic to that, how long before price parity between EVs and ICE cars? I personally think MG have gone a long way to getting the prices down. I still think that the MG at 21 is still not quite there. We, I personally believe that we need family size EVs with good range, sub £20,000. And that I think then that will actually make it more available and more desirable to more people i think that twenty thousand pound barrier is it sometimes is a brick wall for some people they see twenty thousand pound and below as affordable and actually in these terms and higher purchase terms it is much more affordable than when you're paying mid 20s 30s and 40s so my personal view is sub twenty thousand pounds for a decent ev I think probably 80%, something like in the UK, of new car purchases are something like PCP and the like. So I'm guessing, sort of following on from John's point, it, maybe it's a £300 a month. So if you're paying £200 a month for uh, a pet, an ICE car and £100 a month on fuel, then if you can get an electric car for 280 a month, um, I think probably the monthly figure might be a more accurate way of getting people dialed in rather than the, the retail price. And I think a lot of that then goes back to education because still people don't correlate running an an electric car to saving themselves money on fuel. They seem to see electric car, ice car, ice car cost me this, why does that electric car not cost me the same or less? Mm, And then they build in the the costing of fuel. But as a really as an afterthought, if at all, this whole life cost... Mm. um, angle at looking at things is very very new to most people and when we've talked about this before in that it's that long-term cost yes evs are, are more expensive at the moment and i agree with you john i think sub twenty thousand definitely is that sweet point or just below and then when people are educated to say well actually i'm getting a cheaper car or a monthly cheaper cost but then actually my fuel costs are almost not zero but they're significantly cheaper and the maintenance costs kind of almost go away as well so all the things that you would pay normally over the course of say a four or five year term you know if you're a loan um, uh, if you've got a loan for a car for instance you have to take those into account or if you don't then you have in many cases expensive bills and you don't necessarily take that into the cost of the car whereas electric cars you're pretty much going right i'm buying the car uh my i have zero tax i've got a significantly reduced fuel rate and that's kind of all i have to worry about apart from wear and tear which you would anyway so it, the, the equation is simpler but i think the education piece up front and certainly with the dealers and things like that needs to be more accurate in terms of telling people not just what the cost is now but what the cost is going forward sort of connected with that 
we're now seeing uh, far more of the mainstream dealers producing electric vehicles. I mean, VW have obviously come out with them, but Honda have got one, Vauxhall have got one, etc. Do we feel that that will solve the issues that we seem to have with poor education on the part of the dealerships? Because if they've then got that knowledge, they can frame a purchase as saying, yes, it's going to cost you more initially, but in the long term, you're saving money for exactly the same reason Simon has said. I think, going back to a question before, I think we're pretty, I reckon we must be pretty close to parity. David Harvey. If you are a high mileage driver and driving, say, a company vehicle in terms of monthly running costs, and but the answer to your most recent question is perhaps that they, you're just down to the big manufacturers really putting a very strong marketing message out there, um, emphasising that cost of running a, a vehicle per month. Um, and I think we're probably closer to parity than we realise for high mileage users that can save a fortune. If you're, if you're doing high mileage and you're spending £200 a month on fuel, then a £300 a month electric car uh, doesn't seem quite so expensive. I also think there's going to be a big shift next April. Yeah. with the benefit in kind yeah. for electric vehicles mm. coming to zero yeah. I will see because we had a big surge with the particularly the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid there was a big surge in company car users buying those mm. because they were getting such a good deal on their benefit in kind I think we're going to get the same thing with electric cars because now we've got electric cars that are doing you know over 300 miles of charge and you're paying zero in company car tax and then also the benefit for that, they're also going to save on their fuel costs as well. I do think there will be quite a big surge next April. How long before price parity between electric charging and fossil fuels? Ooh, will we hit price parity between fossil fuels and electric? Neil Roberts. I, f I think at the moment we're still a good few years off, uh, simply because... At the moment, there isn't the critical mass of electric car adoption to, to force that. We will, I'm, I'm sure we will see it. I'm sure we will see it. But by that point, electric car purchase prices will also be at parity or lower than current diesel and petrol cars. Yeah. So it's, it's almost swings and roundabouts. You're, you're either paying up front now by paying a little bit more for your car, or you're paying a little bit less in the future but paying more for your fuel. But then 60% of people will still be charging at home. Just uh, to add to that, I mean, obviously we know that at some point there won't be a government grant for buying an electric car. Um, they will at some point be charging electric cars for um, road fund license. Um, we know they already do that on more expensive cars due to the luxury car tax, as they call it ridiculous but <laughs> personally I think yes we're going to see electricity prices go up but what they're going to have to be very mindful of is the fact that you know people still have a right to electricity to heat their homes or use their utilities at home so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens over the next few years um, we know for a fact that obviously governments and fossil fuel companies make a good whack of money off petrol and fossil fuels so you know i can't imagine someone like bp who has the charge master network wanting to lose that and governments certainly not wanting to lose that because now everyone plugs in at home so petrol stations that have closed down and they've mm. taken the pumps out and replaced them with charges yeah. are we in favor of that or does that perpetuate the fossil fuel model uh, I'm very much in favour of that. The the one I recently saw, I believe, was in Maryland. Yeah. Um, I think it's a fabulous idea. If if the if the infrastructure already exists, you already have a, a shop, you already have a forecourt, you already have electricity supply. You have an electricity supply. You, you have you already have planning for that piece of land for that particular use mm. case. It's a perfect. It's a perfect use. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Another thing I would sort of say on that is in places like London where land is at a premium, those pieces of land are going to be very valuable to charge point manufacturers and suppliers for being able to get, you know, charge points in these really built up tight sh small spaces and you know especially for places like that where you're going to get a lot of taxis and things like that. The ta for the taxi drivers who 
you know we know they're starting to use electric vehicles now it's it will be perfect because they can just stop in for 20 minutes so you know mandatory 20 minute break and charge up you know just at an old petrol station forecourt mm. it's interesting though because like one of the um old garages i used to go uh, past on the a1 was derelict for five years and there's got to be thousands of these across the country but most of them have actually still got electricity actually going to the site but it's just maybe shut off what a great opportunity for a charging company to come and say let's just buy that piece of land put in eight ultra chargers open a shop so a manufacturer or a, even a costa or starbucks can come in on the same site and there you go it's a mini charging hub on these old sites that can be reused it's it seems pointless that or almost insanity that no one's actually thought of doing that and they seem to be picking these don't get me wrong very convenient and good locations but these locations were prominent before as petrol garages so people always knew that they were there and you drive past them so why not use those old sites and revamp them is free charging a good idea or not depends what company <laughs> <laughs> Free vend, everyone has a good free I know, vend. I know Neil has a, a particularly uh, good opinion on this. Well, I have an opinion. Uh, <laughs> I very much am of the opinion that I want to see investment into charging infrastructure. And investment into the infrastructure will only happen if, if they become close to self-funding. These charge points have to be able to make a profit so that the people installing them can have enough money to put more in. So I would much rather see far fewer free charging points and a lot more paid charging points as long as the payment is not over the top. So the, the current prices that we're seeing at the moment, Ecotricity excluded, is still about half the price per mile of, of diesel. And I think that is a good place for it to be. It brings in enough funds for the charging provider to be able to invest in new infrastructure and to keep the current infrastructure working. I'm sure I heard this on a certain other podcast as well, where if you were to put free charge points in the supermarkets, for example, why would people charge at home if they can? You're going to end up with a demand on you know, free electricity from these charge points at the supermarkets. Now, I can't see, certainly at this stage, that they're going to put in one, you know, one post per bay of parking that's there, and you're just going to end up with a squabble for charge points. So I think if they can run the cost of those similar to what someone might pay on a day rate of electricity at home, then I think you're going to find a happy balance there. So those who can charge at home will charge at home. And those that can't, like Simon, for example, aren't going to get completely screwed for trying to charge their car. I would rather pay the top end price that we currently seem to have, like the 35, 36 P a kilowatt, to get a reliable service on knowing mm -hmm. that I can turn up to a bank of Insfalts, Ionities, Polars, whatever it may be, and they just work. It's If it's contactless, easy, and they're reliable, that's all an EV driver wants. You've got to make it as close to that petrol station or ease of that petrol station experience as possible for the adoption to continue. And people need to understand that the chargers, especially the ultra chargers, are really, really expensive. You know, insane costs. So any investment like you said, Neil, have to have to come back for not only the company running because at the end of the day it's still a business, but also to maintain it and invest and and get better. So unless we do that, I think um, that's why some companies have failed or failing. But then you have companies that are doing well and investing more because they realise that model and that model does work. You know, Polar has shown that over the last what. In the year and a half that I've been driving an EV, I've gone from strength to strength. And I, whenever I go anywhere now, I pretty much rely on Polar because I know that there's always a Polar charger somewhere that I can go to. And it's reliable. And that's all as a driver that you want. You don't want that constant thought of, oh, I've got to go here, but is there going to be a charge there? Is it going to be reliable? Is it going to be working? You know, if I rely on um, some of these companies, now I know that that's going to be the case. And yes, there's going to be an odd case where they're not going to be working but it's fewer rather than the larger majority of them but as we've said before the destination chargers is just as important because 
rapid chargers, in my opinion, should be outside of towns uh, and uh, destinations within towns and a uh, lots of them, not just let's put two in a car park because there's an EV driver local that may want to use it. Let's make a big bank of them or a floor of them. So it doesn't matter whether you're iced or not, you're always going to get charged. Finally, What's your favourite charging network? Well, I think based on uh, the other weekend's experience, it's uh, got to be the one that the Renault Zoe owners hate, uh, Instavolt. <laughs> we uh, we were lucky enough to use some of their new chargers. Um, now, the, our Nissan Leaf only charges at max uh, 50 kilowatts. Um, and we were seeing 49.4, which is the fastest we've seen off any network. So, therein lies your reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, my answer is actually going to be exactly the same, but for a slightly different reason, which is which is nice. If I had the choice of going to a Polar at a Holiday Inn or wherever, or an Instavolt, be it at a petrol station or wherever it happens to be, I will opt for the Instavolt, even though it's more expensive, because I know that there are two at each site at least, and at least one of them is going to be working. We, we have occasionally found an Instavolt pair where one of them is offline, the other one's working. If it was a polar installation and it was offline, I may only have five miles left of range and the next charger along is 15 miles away. And I would be on a flat bit of shame. I've already sort of said earlier, but like Instavolt for me, I didn't actually think about that, that as a reason, but you're right, if you go to Holiday Inn, there's generally one and if that's not working, you have to get to another one as long as you've got enough range. With Instavolt, they tend to put them in in pairs. And I think that's got to be at least the standard going forward. Mm -hmm. Put them in in pairs, one fails and you've got the other one to rely on. Or, you know, better yet, charging hubs like Milton Keynes and Dundee and places like that. I, I personally think charging hubs have got to be the, the future. Put one of those outside every town or city. Then, you know, and have almost have a park and ride with it as well. So take the take the cars out of the city let people charge at a charging hub with some facilities there they go into town on hopefully an electric bus or something else skateboard you never know um and then come back pick up their car and, uh, and away they go there's got to be a, a, a better way of doing this we always i agree with the destination charging stuff and things like that and i agree with your points around like having multiple things in there i also think that there's a better way of doing things as well in terms of we don't want cars in cities and things like that anymore you know london specifically is a good example is that let's take the cars out of that let's make the cities a bit more greener and try and kind of get people out of their cars and doing some other stuff getting the better infrastructure around it but then at the same time putting in the better infrastructure for ev cars and things like that so i think as well um so pretty impressed with the um, engineers as well the fact that you can charge two cars off one point actually i think it's a very mm. very valid thing you know you can't do that on some other chargers mm. it's a case of there's three connectors on there but you can only charge one car off it um yes you might look at in some cases you know you're splitting the power between two cars but at the end of the day it's a charge point um and having being able to connect more than one car to a charge point is going to be more crucial as EV uptake increases um, unless they're going to start putting more charge points in yeah. I mean for what it's worth I yeah. I agree I think any provider that can provide contactless and multiple chargers at say at one location is going to get my vote I mean I love Polar don't get me wrong but for exactly the same reason you've said I've, I've on one occasion recently turned up and the two charge points that I usually use which are three miles apart both of them were out of service I think the issue on one of them was somebody had physically jammed the emergency stop button and it, it would not release and the other one not working at the moment engineer coming out so John Brooks I'd have to say engineer at the moment um, from a club perspective they've been really supportive um, they've um, last meet we had they opened up the charges to free vend mm -hmm and we have just purchased a gazebo for the club for us to go and attend non-EV events to talk to non-EV owners about electric vehicles and uh, Ngini have paid for the gazebo for us um, so the gazebo will be joint logoed um, but obviously that's really good for us as a club so I found them really supportive their charges have, obviously they've got a bit of a problem at the moment people are grumbling about the 
pre-authorization charge, which I, having spoke to them, I know they're trying to reduce that at the moment. But their charges always seem to work. I haven't heard anybody go to an Ingenie charger, try to use it, and it hasn't worked. They also cover what I said earlier, that you have the option of either having an RFID card or you can just use your debit card and away you go. Um, for me, it's probably Instavolt. Um, and that's probably, probably a surprise to many people. I, I would have probably normally said Polar. Um, Polar I tend to use the most, but Instavolt have always been one of those ones that have come a long way in a very short space of time and have always been reliable. So when I've turned up to them, they've always worked. They've always been contactless payment. Yes, they don't have AC, so that's a problem for you know, like some uh, Renault Zoe's and, and things like that. And they're obviously on the higher price bracket of rapid chargers. But I don't mind paying that sort of price if I know I can turn up. It be easy, contactless, quick, and usable. And generally, they're in locations where you can grab a coffee or something like that. So. Instavolt probably will be my, my primary one and I think these sort of companies are only going to get better. Uh, Echo for um, you know the one that you said John, That's I've used those multiple times and again it's reliability um, is key for me especially as an EV uh, driver and an EV driver that largely relies on public charging it has to be reliable. So let's wrap up by seeing if there's some cool EV or renewable thing we've come across that we can share with our listeners. Yes, here's mine. SpaceX, an update on their Starship. Yep, you heard that right, a Starship. This thing dwarfs previous rockets in comparison that they've made today and is not just set to be used for space, but into Earth travel as well. Think UK to Australia in 30 minutes. This will also be used to go to Mars, SpaceX's longer term strategy. Orbit refueling and ability to land like the current rockets, uh, i.e. basically back down to earth and uh, be reusable. And the reusable ability, or the reusability, will be multiple times a day, not just a week or a couple of days. And um, here's the exciting bit, first flights next year. You really have to see this thing, it's exciting stuff. Um, this thing is massive and um, personally I can't wait. Again, it's a uh, more innovation that SpaceX is doing beyond NASA and any other manufacturer out there. So it's exciting times indeed. My cool thing is, I'm not sure how cool it is. Well, I mean, it is cool, but I'm not sure what, whether it's a thing or not. But anyway, a couple of weeks ago, I took a friend of mine, Gary Wales, otherwise known as the other Gary, to the Oxford EV meet and Gary drives an internal combustion engine vehicle at the moment and it was having mechanical issues, the timing chain went on it. So I thought, well, you know, he's expressed an interest in electric vehicles in the past. So I took him with me and we met up with a few people there. He, uh, he had a drive in Simon's i3 and he had a drive in a brand new Model 3 uh, performance. And of course we had a launch in it and uh, he spent a good almost an hour chatting with the uh, the driver and day before yesterday he sent me a little text through saying uh, he just ordered his own model 3 so we've always said on this show that the best way to get anybody into an ev is to physically sit them in an ev and actually get them to uh, take a ride in it or preferably take a drive in it which is exactly what we did with uh, Gary and it's uh, proven very fruitful so his should be due for delivery I believe sometime in November and uh, I'd very much like to get him onto the show to chat about his experiences about it. I've got a second cool thing and this is something that came up quite recently. Uh, those of you who follow Bobby Llewellyn and the Fully Charged show will know that one of the people who also follows uh, that feed is Duncan Jones, who's um, Man Made Moon on Twitter. Uh, the reason he's called Man Made Moon is because he's the film director who made the film Moon with Sam Rockwell and Kevin Spacey. And he posted quite an interesting little, quite a funny little tweet yesterday, or should I say the day before we're actually recording this, which uh, was basically given out to Bobby because he was a Patreon supporter and he was expecting his name to appear on the list of Patreon uh, supporters on the last Fully Charged Live 
uh, podcast episode that went out. Um, and he didn't. And he was uh, sort of fairly tongue in cheek pointing this out. And I tweeted him and said, well, you know, if Bobby doesn't come back and say anything uh, and apologise, then I'm quite happy to give you a shout out on my podcast, uh, which I'm doing now. So big shout out to uh, Duncan. He's one of the few quote unquote celebrities who has expressed an active interest in renewables, electric vehicles over and above the, you know, I've got a Tesla and that's it kind of mentality, which uh, a lot of other celebrities, shall we say, have been uh, known to do. I will be really interested in actually having a chat with uh, Duncan to find out what his interest is in uh, renewables and how that affects, obviously, he lives in California, which has a slightly different view of these things than many other parts of the US. I'd be interested to get his uh, perspective on that. So um, I'll make a few inquiries. Might come off, might not. We'll see. And that's our show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact us, Simon is at The EV Side on Twitter and YouTube. And I'm The Real Gary C on Twitter. If you want to contact us on Twitter, use either of those or our own EV Musings Twitter account, at Musings EV. Don't ask. If you're wanting a quick reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called So You've Gone Electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. We're available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it makes us feel loved and it gives us better visibility for other people trying to find our podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye.